past six o'clock and so it's time to call the Monday January 4th 2022 meeting of the Evans City Council to order uh would the clerk please call the roll Hi, council member Fleming council member Kelly council member Braithwaite here council member Wynn here Council Member Newsma? Here. Council Member Burns? Council Member Sufferden? Here. Council Member Ravel? Here. Council Member Reed? We have a quorum present and are prepared to do our work for the evening. Um, We'll begin uh, with my public announcements and proclamations, just uh, two very quick things. Uh, first, wanted to um, share with the, um, the council and the community and the city staff that uh, we've, uh, the uh, deputy city manager, Kimberly Richardson, uh, has completed her time with the city, is moving on to a very exciting opportunity in Peoria, and just wanted to, again, thank her for the um, really remarkable and extensive work she's done uh, for the city of Evanston during a uh, really critical moment uh, in our in our time. So I just hope everyone uh, will join me um, in wishing her every success in what is, again, a, a really uh, exciting opportunity. Uh, our loss is Peoria's gain, and uh, it's hard for me to, to, to accept uh, that we have to live with this, but it's really, honestly, a, a great thing when our, our staff move on to, to situations like, like these. It's a, it's a sign of um, of how all the work they've done here is respected across the state and region and country. So uh, first of all, I wanna thank everyone, uh, thank Kimberly for that and hope everyone will join me in that uh, in that uh, sentiment. Um, and secondly, just wanted to acknowledge that with the, the weather that's uh, come through the region on a rolling basis in the last few days, our uh, our staff has been working around the clock and wanna uh, thank them for that and thank residents for, for um, calling in uh, situations that need extra attention. And uh, obviously these are, uh, not easy times, but it's really um, important that we have a, a group of dedicated, skilled uh, professionals serving our community. I want to say a big, big thank you to our team uh, in this moment. Um, with that, uh, the next item is the city manager's public announcements. Good evening, members of city council, uh, Mayor Biss, Clerk Mendoza. Um, Kelly Gandersky, interim city manager. I want to echo the mayor's sentiments. Um, we want to thank Kimberly Richardson for all of her hard work and dedication to the city of Evanston over the past six years. She started um, at the city as an assistant to the city manager and worked her way up to deputy city manager. And I think um, all of you have had the pleasure of working with her on a board commissioner committee or otherwise. So we wanna wish Kimberly um, very well and a big congratulations um, for her new position at the city at Peoria. And we hope that she will always remember the city of Evanston as her home. Um, second, not to uh, belabor the point, but uh, weather warnings have been up in e-news on social media. So we're asking community members to please um, follow the minute to minute um, guidance from our public works department and our communications team about parking. Um, we understand this is a difficult time when it snows so much. Um, city staff is doing the best they can to accommodate those who have to move their cars. Um, the Maple Street parking garage is open for free. Um, and Evanston Township High School is also letting us use their lot as well. Um, and there's a few other spots um, residents are able to move their cars to if they so need. So we just ask that you please be mindful of the notices going out. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to call 311 and someone can direct you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is communications from the city clerk. Um, hi, I wanted to just acknowledge um, public comment from that was sent and submitted by Evans and Light TV and Betty Esther. Um, I also did want to comment about SP1. I've received um, two emails and a few phone calls asking if the city clerk um, would be included in um, resolution um, AR22. Um, and from what I understand, um, since I am not technically a member of the council, um, 
I would not be included in that, but I would more than welcome um, being included. I think it sets a good example um, moving forward in these cases when we do have um, emergencies. And I think the city clerk um, being so close to all of you should also um, be included into that resolution. Um, so I'd appreciate an amendment. Um, I'm I fully support this resolution. I'm fully vaccinated, um, boosted, and um, have young children. So. Um, I would very much welcome if one of you could make that amendment. Thank you. Happy to do that. Thank you, Clerk Mendoza. Um, thanks, thanks for the for the flag. Um, next on our agenda is public comment. Um, today in public comment, every speaker will be uh, given three minutes. Uh, we'll begin with Mike Vasilko, who will be followed by Carla Thomas, and then William Petty. Um, Mayor, this is Luke Starr. I think Mike Pasoko is having uh, some audio issues, so we might want to come back to him. Okay, we'll come back to him at the end. Um, so we'll begin then with Carla Thomas, who will be followed by William Petty and then Tina Payton. Hi, good evening. Carla Thomas, second ward resident. Um, I'm here to, to talk about interim city manager Kelly Sandusky's statement in the first ward meeting. Um, preempting the city's plan to post signs around downtown Evanston, discouraging making gifts to panhandlers, but instead donating to organizations. First of all, I want to address the term panhandlers. Using this term gives us a fancy word to simply other these individuals in our community and avoid facing the reality that these are residents of our community whom our government system has failed. These residents are on our streets because this city and the government as a whole has failed them and the nonprofits that arise up to do the job of a socialized government that a socialized government should be doing. And don't tell me we don't have a socialized government because we are socializing big businesses with tax breaks. Locally, we socialize Northwestern University as they exist here on stolen land and do not pay any taxes for that land. But I digress. This city and country fail them and nonprofits who rise up to do the job of our socialized government are stretched to their limits. And now when residents of our community step in with the mega charitable stop gaps, the same government responsible for these hardships is attempting to put an end to that as well. Have y'all met white people? I mean, do we not have enough of a policing problem in this community? Why on earth would we add to our policing crisis? This will undoubtedly turn to folks calling cops to have individuals who this country, this, this city has failed removed. We understand that poverty and racial lines are irrevocably undetanglable because of the violent history of this country. So how in the goddess's name can we even begin to reconcile these actions with our racial equity ordinance and promises? Who are these signs disproportionately likely to affect in negative ways? Is anyone surprised that this first came up in the first ward council meeting? This is just the latest example of Evanston wanting drive-by diversity only until the reality of the socioeconomic diversity is too often in our faces. There are people that this community has failed outside every grocery store in town. In my failure to plan meals, I'm at the grocery store at least three times a week and I've never felt harassed by individuals in this, uh, that this system has failed. I will be the first to point out that systemic equity and charity are absolutely two different things. But we as citizens will be damned if we let leaders who fail to provide for these citizens, uh, these residents, um, stop, then stop us from doing the little that we can. Because government often offers them no better option. I am a thousand percent for systemic change that creates fewer people who have their hands out for charity. But to cut out the charitable efforts that make uh, that attempt to reroute uh, attempt to reroute them through our already strained nonprofits uh, makes it so that these folks can't do the very little to that they can to survive from meal to meal. To double down on our failure and tie the hands of the citizens to chip in in the small ways they can adds extra violence to our already broken system. And to say that it works in Rockford, Illinois, because yeah, Rockford, Illinois is a bastion of racial equity. How about we do our research and realize the vehement protests in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Anchorage, Alaska, and how in uh, Canloops, Canada, that these signs were taken down just as quickly as they went up because of um, citizen outcry. So addressing the acts of handler handling um, when the root cause is poverty is like giving vaccines for coughing when the root cause is uh, COVID. 
I am here to ask that before any more work is done on this racist, classist, and just plain elitist harebrained scheme, that the City Council realizes that they have an equity ordinance they are supposed to be living up to. To move forward on this part, on this idea, would be the City of Evanston telling the homeless residents uh, or, pa or panhandling residents and yes, I say residents because they are residents, that you have failed that you're not only okay with failing them, but you also are gonna do everything in your power to edge them out of our town for the comfort of wealthy white citizens. This is the opposite of equity. Heavenston strikes again. Thank you. The next speaker is William Petty, followed by Tina Payton and then Priscilla Giles. Okay, uh, I I guess my video's off, but can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, thank you for allowing me this time. Um, I'm talk. My concern is with the. Okay, I'm gonna start my video here. Okay, you don't really need to see me. I'm not that good looking to begin with, but <laughs> uh, my concern is with the latest mitigation order. Uh, that we have to show proof of vaccination in order to get into many uh, establishments in. Evanston, uh, the COVID thing has caused a, a lot of disruption in business in Evanston over the last year. Businesses have gone out. My, my very favorite restaurant, as a matter of fact, the little Mexican restaurant went out of business. Uh, we don't have a Barnes and Nobles anymore, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this, this is overkill. And I, and I think the problem is that we've been given a lot of misinformation. And I'm, kind of, I'm beginning to feel like Charlie Brown and, and, and Lucy with the football. And here are some of my concerns. We were originally told that COVID came from the wet market in Wuhan. Well, that doesn't appear to be the truth anymore. We were told that the NIH was not funding gain-of-function research at the Wuhan lab. Well, we know that's not, that doesn't hold up. We were shown people in Wuhan dropping dead on the sidewalks due to COVID, and that is unverified. We were first told that masks were useless, then they became mandatory. Then we were recommended too, then a visor. Now we're, we are being told that cloth masks are useless. We were told that the whole world had to be become vaccinated to go back to normal. But now we are seeing that the countries with the highest vaccination rates are experiencing the biggest surges in infection. And the highest percent per 100,000 population are people who have gotten the third dose. We were told two weeks ago, but we were told that two weeks of lockdowns would slow the spread and flatten the curve. After months and months, all they did was destroy businesses and ruin lives. Even the World Health Organization has discredited lockdowns. In 2020, there was no wide scale vaccination. Here in America, we had over 20,000 infections and 361,000 deaths. In 2021, after widespread vaccination, we had over 34 million cases and 462,000 deaths. Since the start of the mass COVID vaccination, there have been 732,882 adverse vaccine events reported in the U.S. alone, and 10,162 of them are deaths. 78% of all deaths are people who are overweight or obese. 75% of deaths are people with at least four comorbidities. 40% of all deaths have occurred in nursing homes. The highest percentage of deaths by age are people over 65. Many deaths are, 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 are people over 85, which is above our current life expectancy. All repurposed, drug, repurposed drugs that actually stop COVID in the real world, drugs that are decades long, that have safety records that are decades long, that are better than Tylenol, have been suppressed and demonized, even though there is abundant proof that they are effective against COVID if employed early. Why don't we concentrate on the people who are truly vulnerable and help them and leave the rest of us alone? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. How many Evanston businesses, many of them family owned, have to suffer before we look Lucy in the eye and say no more? Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Tina Payton, who will be followed by Priscilla Giles and then Mike Pasilko. Good evening. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Happy New Year for the ones that I haven't spoken to. 
Many of you ran your campaign promising transparency, fairness, and equity, listening to your constituents and more. So far, it appears just to be more ribbon cutting and hand clapping and not addressing the real issues in Evanston. Question, how many black people own commercial or residential property in the downtown Evanston beside the Robinson? I'm sure the number is one or none. Currently, you have a bunch of tall luxury apartment buildings and more to come. When you really need is businesses downtown Evanston and you don't have any income for the city. That's why we have to pay high taxes. You also have projects in the pipeline that have white people owning the building and only renting to black people, pretending that they will be uh, an investor later on. Is this really fair and equitable as you pretend? Are you listening to us when we are talking? It doesn't appear to be fair and equitable when you only have white people owning property and pretending that they're going to put forth and have the black people be a renter or an owner of a project. This is not happening just in one project in the pipeline. This is happening in more. What is reparations really about? This 16 people that were just chosen, which needs to be public information, a list of names. Is reparations for the harassment of the city officials, which is supposed to be, and a, a not fair and equitable opportunity? Well, that doesn't seem to be the case right now. I'm sure that I will receive many code violations after my statement today. But think about what you're doing because I'm interested in my 40 acres in a mule because I at least could get something maybe in downtown Evanston as a black person. Black lives matter all of the time not some of the time. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Priscilla Giles, followed by Mike Basilko. I don't think I see Ms. Giles in the Zoom, uh, so we'll move on to Mike. Mike Vasilko, and then circle back. Good evening, thank you. Um, two quick things. R2, I spoke about this at the last meeting. Um, there should be no reason to single out one or two people to receive benefits from the reparation, reparations fund if they sit on the reparations committee because that's more of a conflict of interest than anything else. You shouldn't set the precedent by carving out an exception for somebody on the committee. Those people should leave the committee and then have no conflict of interest. I also don't know why SP2, the hazard pay keeps coming back. Um, Evanston doesn't seem to worry too much about those kind of people that, you know, were on the front lines. Uh, personally, I think they deserve it, but I'm sure you'll deny that one more time tonight. But that leads me to point three, the main point. Um, some of you know that there is um, an Evanston property owner, um, a senior single woman uh, living on a piece of property in Evanston. And this is something Eleanor Ravel is very in tune to, as well as maybe a few other aldermen 
I think Alderman Reed, Burns, and Kelly are aware of the situation. Uh, this woman owns a piece of property, happens to be near the lakefront, has a bunch of neighbors who complain about her all the time. <clears throat> her um, city has elected, this is back when Grandersky was in charge of the law department, um, has elected to pursue having this person uh, basically evicted from her property. Um, I have to admit, I don't know all the details and really don't want to go into the person's name or anything like that. But it seems inappropriate for the city to go out of its way. And I, and I understand people are going well out of their way to um, have this property condemned have this person evicted. And my sense is, if things go the way things go in Evanston, that piece of property will end up being divvied up between the neighbors who, uh, again, are Evanston's happy few. Um, and I'm not sure what is gonna happen to the to the woman who actually lives in that home and lives in that, in that property. My understanding is there's a hearing tomorrow the city has an opportunity to back off on this threat. Oh, basically, it's uh, almost eminent that this um, foreclosure is going to take place again at the uh, because of the actions of our now interim city manager and former um, law department chief and Eleanor Ravel. I'm aware of the situation and has done nothing to stop this from occurring. So if it turns out that this property ends up being taken, uh, the person who lives there gets booted out, and that property ends up being divvied up between the happy few, um, I think it's something that's going to be a scar on all of your, all the council members and the mayor that's gonna be a scar on your reputations uh, going forward. Uh, I'll personally make sure it's not forgotten uh, in the public realm. So please take an opportunity to direct your staff to back off and to withdraw their um, threat of foreclosing on this in court tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the final remaining speaker is Priscilla Giles, who I believe I do not see in the Zoom. Ms. Giles, are you are you there? I don't believe so, Mayor. Thank you, Luke. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> in that case, uh, that concludes public comment um, this uh, this evening. Uh, this brings us to special orders of business, uh, beginning with SP one. Uh, would someone like to make a motion regarding item SP one? I move item SP1. Uh, oh, I move item SP1 adoption of resolution 8R22, amending the rules of the city council to require council members to be vaccinated against COVID 19 or otherwise test negative in advance of city council meetings. Thank you. Council member Reed moves item SP1. Council member Burns seconds. Um, opening discussion and just want to remind yes. folks that uh, the clerk asked. Uh, for an amendment to be considered. And so if someone wants to make such a motion, I would entertain that as well. Um, yes. I ask folks to use the raise your hand function in Zoom because that's the only way that guarantees I see people in an equitable way. I think um, let's go. I think Council Member Reed has hand up first. So both Reed followed by Nusma. Yeah. Um, so I, I uh, am in favor of uh, this resolution. I think it's important for uh, city council members to follow the same rules that our staff uh, and the rules that we want to set for other folks. So I think this makes sense. Um, I agree that the uh, clerk should be included in this as well. And so I will move that amendment as well as I think another group that was left out is are the folks who serve on our committees. Um, I think the same requirement should be in place for uh, the council members, the clerk, and folks who serve on our boards, committees, and commissions. And so I want to make an amendment to include uh, the clerk and board committee and commission members. 
Um, so I was, I was all set to relax my amendments in writing uh, oh, rule okay. because for the clerk, because it's so clear, but actually to amend this to include other BCCs would be a little bit more complicated because obviously the, the text of the resolution itself refers to city council meetings as opposed to uh, board board meetings. So it becomes a little more complicated. We, we can do that, um, but I just want to make sure we get that right rather than pass something we're not totally sure about. Okay, yeah, we can, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put that in writing and uh, make it say meeting, public meetings, um, you know, 10 public meetings as opposed to city council meetings, because I think this should uh, count for, you know, council members attend, uh, you know, we have various subcommittees and committees that we serve on, uh, and we should be testing in advance of that, and the folks that we serve with as well should be testing or fully vaccinated, or a mix of both is what I think is probably best. Um, I do have a question. I, I do wonder, um, you know, particularly uh, including uh, everyone, if uh, we should include uh, accessibility to testing for both city staff uh, to test for both city staff, our volunteers or on committees and council members for whoever wants, you know, whether you're regardless of your vaccination status, if you want to make sure you're keeping folks safe before coming to council, I think we should make those available. Um, so before we go to Council Member Newsom, it looks like both Corporation Council Cummings and uh, Interim City Manager Andrewski have responses to that, perhaps both parts of that. So I think, go ahead um, and um, in whatever order you guys want to go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, Clerk Mendoza, Nicholas Cummings, Corporation Council. Um, I just had, uh, I'll take the second part of Council Member Reed's comment about testing. I know that the Director of Health and Human Services is working on a, an agreement to get that done and, and available for uh, folks in the community. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm gonna believe that that will probably be available to city staff as well as members of city council uh, for testing. And I actually, actually reviewed that agreement prior to this meeting. So I know that that is in the works, uh, but with respect to the amendment, um, I would ask uh, that the requirement for BCC is well taken, but it could be placed in a different section. Um, because the city council rules, um, we placed it here because it deals with members of city council, but there are mem there are other rules that may deal with members of BCCs. So if we can maybe take that portion and put it someplace else, but insert the clerk into this particular resolution, um, that would make it a little bit easier on us and we can put it someplace else for the boards, commissions, and committees. Thank you. Uh, and so I just want to make sure I understand your request. Are you requesting that we hold off on the BCC part to give you and council member Reed time to work out the text properly and then we can bring it back to the next meeting? Yes. And council member Reed, is that something you're comfortable with? Uh, I, I don't think it's that complicated. I think we, it's very clear what the requirement is, is and um, I certainly I agree. I just think it goes in a different section of the rules. Um, yeah, I think we'll just uh, I'll, we can identify that section very quickly. I don't think it'll take going to another meeting. We just identify the section and the language is it, it, <laughs> this is not complicated. So I think we can move on this and keep you know our community and folks safe. Yeah, I just want to say I agree with that. I think if, if we're going to take action on it, we can do that tonight and then you know update whatever part of the code we need to afterwards. Um, all right. Well, so I'll let let's move on then. I'll let maybe Councilmember Reed and and. Nick can communicate via email or text and, and try to get this hammered out. There's a couple of folks in line anyhow, so let's let's continue the discussion and see if this amendment can take shape while that goes on. Uh, so next will be Newsma followed by Braithwaite. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just gonna second the motion to uh, add the clerk uh, to the resolution in front of us. Um, I guess we'll hold off uh, and we'll see what to do about the BCCs. <clears throat> So I'm not sure if that's a real second or not uh, while we're sorting everything out. It's nothing to second quite yet, but we'll, yeah. uh, we'll come back to you when the moment arises. Uh, Council Member Braithwaite. I guess this is more a question for our, our, our staff and I'm curious to know how you are monitoring this just operationally across the board. Um, since I've been, I think January, the first or second week of January, um, we're stopped. I have to show my, you know, proof of vaccination when I come into 
all the buildings. So I'm glad that there's an overall acceptance on city council. We should be able to move through this very quickly. And to council member Reed, I mean, everyone stopped anyway coming into the building and we're not meeting, you know, we're not meeting in person, it's all remote. So I think we do have time to work through whatever details our corporation council is, is, is uh, suggesting. But Kelly or anyone, I can you just give some overall feedback how the process is working citywide and are we seeing compliance? Those that are not vaccinated, are they staying home or actually standing someplace and taking a test, I guess is my curious question. Sure, I'm happy to jump in on that um, and I'll let Ike chime in um, for anything that I've missed. But uh, again, good evening, uh, Mayor Biss, Clerk Mendoza, members of City Council, Kelly Gandersky. Um, it's Gandersky, um, Interim City Manager. Um, I want to let you know that the process is working quite well. Um, Ike Ogbo, our Director of Public Health, has um, information from the IDPH. Um, so when you are vaccinated for against COVID-19, that information goes to IDPH. And um, because we are a health department, Ike has access to that list. So he is able to look up um, staff members who are uh, who have received the vaccine for compliance. And we've provided an exception um, for those that do not want to have the vaccine. They must submit to weekly PCR testing. Um, we, um, they are uploading their results to a, a form that goes directly to Health and Human Services, so it is HIPAA protected. And then Ike is able to verify their testing and test results um, through that uh, portal. Um, first, we have had very good compliance. Um, there have been some staff members who have not complied and uh, disciplinary action uh, ensues because our policy has been in effect since November 15th. Um, but we have seen uh, probably 99% of our staff comply. Um, so it's not been a reoccurrence where we have people uh, failing to test or failing um, or, or not getting the vaccine. Um, so it, it is it is working quite well. And Ike, if you're on, if you want to add anything else that I may have missed. I'm not sure if I see Ike in the Zoom, although. Yeah, I don't think I see him either. Okay. Councilor Braithwaite, did you have follow-ups on that? No, that, that answered my question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Burns. Yeah, and this is more for clarity. Uh, I get clarity overall, but certainly if we include, we expand this to include um, members of our BCCs, boards, committees, and commissions. Uh, so this, this is, um, 24 hours taken within 24 hours of each in-person city council, or if we um, approve one of council member Reed's amendments or 24 hours before an in-person committee meeting, or, you know, does this still apply if the meeting is held remotely? So the, the goal of the rule, um, this particular body has met in person for the most part. And I think I actually mentioned this in the memo for the for the special order. Uh, the board's commissions and committees, which um, has a, a diversity of people that are involved in them, including a lot of those who are elderly, uh, did not feel comfortable originally going back in person prior, you know, even before we even began discussing this rule. And so we had to seek a consultation from the Illinois Municipal League on how to handle allowing them to be able to meet virtually while city council was still meeting in person. And that's where it came out, uh, came about that the mayor could issue a uh, declaration of impracticability for the boards, commissions, and committees, which is why now most of them meet virtually. The spirit behind implementing this rule is so that we all could meet in person like we had been prior to Omicron variant spikes. Um, and I think that would probably be the same spirit with respect to the boards, commissions, and committees is to get them to be back in person. I can just tell you from my experience last year, uh, that was not a popular option amongst some of our boards, commissions, and committees, which is which is why they continue to meet virtually now. And I do know that it's being lobbied in Springfield on behalf of municipalities across the state to allow us this flexibility generally, um, because it's actually, you know, it seems to be more accessible even to the public to be able to participate in meetings and not necessarily have to come to the Civic Center 
on a day like today when the wind chill might be, you know, very frigid or something like that. So um, that's so, the spirit so, behind I, it. Let's be clear. So, but if we decide to meet virtually or remotely, and if a committee decides to meet remotely, um, will members who are unvaccinated still need to provide proof that they have been tested? I think for a remote meeting. I think that's ultimately a policy decision by you guys, but that is not the spirit or intent behind implementing the rule. So I, just, instance, I, mean, I think I'll we should be clear, whatever it is, we should just be clear. I, if I could just jump in. So like for city staff, um, we may have remote meetings, um, but we still have the policy in place because there are times that we meet all together in person. Um, so just because we have the remote option, we still want the first, and I'm speaking on behalf of staff, we want the policy in place because there's going to come a time and hopefully um, this is the last we'll see of this tremendous spike. Um, there's going to come a time where we're all going to have to be in person. And that's the ideal is we want to be in person because, you know, it's, it's very effective communication that way. But let me I just think this, let me just clarify yeah, that a little bit. The, 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 the resolution that's in front of us is a, basically it doesn't, you know, the, the city staff, they work for us all the time. So the, the rule for the city staff is test negative weekly. But the resolution for the city council is test negative right before council meetings. And presumably the, the BCC amendment would be test negative right before the board committee or commission meets. And I think council member Burns point is to have a testing mandate that's tied to a remote meeting is kind of absurd. And so I think, I think we would want to say either get vaccinated or else within 24 hours of an in-person meeting have a negative test. Yes. Uh, make, so is that right, council member? Yeah, and I'm and I'm willing to make that that motion to to make you know, to to change it if that's what we're trying to get. And I guess I just want to make sure we're we're being clear here. Is yeah, I, I wonder. Uh, go ahead, sorry, 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 man. No, I was just going to repeat myself. Good. Uh, uh, let me make sure, council member, you've already spoken. Is there anybody else who's not spoken yet who wants to jump in at this time? Not seeing any new hands, so uh, we'll go back to Council Member Reed. Thank you. Uh, I wonder, uh, to uh, given that uh, you know, I think may, I mean uh, Council Member Burns's amendment makes sense. Uh, given that I think there's agreement, right? If the goal of this is to keep everyone safe, that we would have this uh, apply to our uh, committee members and to our clerk. Um, our clerk also does not just attend as a former clerk. It just does not only attend city council meetings. Uh, they, you know, work within the building and interact with uh, patrons of the city outside of that. And so I, I wonder if, uh, when, when is our next meeting? The next city council meeting is February 14th. Oh, uh, that's quite a ways away. I, I, I do wonder um, if, if to, and I suppose that meeting is planned to be virtual at this point. Well, there's no plan, but my hope would be to, to have it in person. And part of one of the things that I think would make it easier to make that decision would be passing some something tonight that includes what was in the packet. Uh, so we would have a, a, a vaccine or a test regime for council members in place by then. Okay. Um, well, I have, uh, a, so I, Council Cummings and I have uh, agreed that uh, rule five is the place uh, that the update for committee for uh, committee members would go. Um, I think this actually, I think the slightly more complicated place is uh, figuring out where the clerk would go uh, just permanently. I guess for the order of just for meetings, it makes sense to put the clerk with us, but I think we should have an overall policy for the clerk that mirrors what is going on with staff. Um, oh, and my last thing is I wonder if we need to include a uh right now i spoke to kelly or uh, manager dan dursky dan dursky about this earlier uh and uh it seems that staff's uh vaccine and testing regime mandate um expires with the collective agree uh, collective bargaining agreement which is in about a year and i wonder if this is something in the rules do we want to set a rule you know that 10 years from now someone's going to look back and think well why is this uh a rule so should we set an expiration or a revisit of this rule in a year as well 
Well, it only expires for those um, staff members that are members of the collective bargaining agreements, uh, but for uh, exempt city staff, the rule is in effect uh, for perpetuity. We had to end it with uh, the collective bargaining agreement deadline because that's how long we have contracts for. So we had to make it parallel with those um, already existing agreements. But for exempt city staff, it's in perpetuity. So I just want to make that distinction. Thank you. Thank you. I do wonder if we should just come back to this in, in a year or, or so at the same time as the collective bargaining agreements just to, you know, at maybe at that point it's become uh, more we the vaccines are you know more effective and we've gotten things under control in a year and it's more like the flu and we don't require a flu vaccine uh, uh or a testing regime to attend uh, council meetings for committee members or council members for that matter uh, so i just wonder if we should revisit this in in some period of time so again 10 years from now there isn't some strange rule um that people are looking back at so I have no problem with any of that. I I, I agree that probably hopefully ten years from now the world is going to be such that we don't want to fall on the books. Um, and I have no problem with building a sunset or a revisit point in. Um, I also I agree with your point that the city clerk is not just someone who shows up on the dais once every couple of weeks, uh, and in many respects operates more like a staff member. There, I would also point out that we only have one city clerk, and she she just disclosed to the public that she is fully vaccinated. So it, the sort of enforcement mechanism of the test part of the vaccinate or test regime is a little bit theoretical you know as long as as long as that individual remains our clerk i wonder if we couldn't um quickly agree to pass um, something that we're comfortable applies properly to the city council to enable us to have an in-person meeting on february 14th uh, and at that meeting make any additional adjustments or changes or enhancements that we think might be further necessary are we not holding any in-person committee meetings uh, until then? Do we know that that is the case? Um, well, I'll turn that over to Mr. Cummings. It's, it it's the only the committees are preferring not to meet in person anyways. Yeah, the only committee meetings that have been held in person that I am aware of are the standing committees of city council and uh, I believe reparations committee. Um, unless that's changed for reparations because of the spike, but the last few uh, reparations committee meetings have been in person at the Civic Center. Council Member Wynn. Uh, Mayor, I think these are all good points, but I, just as you described, uh, in order to be expeditious about our next meeting, uh, being having the possibility that we can meet in person at, on February 14th, uh, I think we should move forward as you described. And, uh, and then if we want to discuss and prepare something for the boards and commissions or uh, any of these other issues um, that we can't uh, deal with um, in good order tonight, uh, then we should do that. But I think in the interest of the city council being able to meet in person, we should do what's necessary for that tonight and, and the other issues we should uh, pick up at the next meeting. Thank you. Is anyone else? Um, seeking to speak? No, I just wanted to say, I, I sent over the, the minor amendment that would just add, it, add in person to the to the resolution. And I think that applies to, yes, the committees, but also um, would add some clarity for city council members. I will second that motion, if that is a motion. It is a motion. Council member Burns moves to amend 8-R-22 uh, to clarify that it applies to in-person meetings. Uh, the text of that amendment is in the inbox of every city council member as well as the uh, corporation council and the interim city manager. Council member Reed seconds uh, that motion. Is there any discussion on the amendment? And of course, folks might, you know, let me, I'm going to pause for about 20 seconds to give folks time to read it and make sure they understand it before we, before we vote. See no, uh, see no discussion. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll on Councilmember Burns' uh, amendment to 
uh, item SP1. Um, Council Member Fleming? Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Braithwaite? Council Member Braithwaite? He's giving it there. I'm mute. I've been having mouse troubles. I said I. Okay, perfect. Council Member Wynn? Aye. Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Sufferton? Aye. Council Member Ravel? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. With eight voting in favor and none voting against, the motion passes and item SP1 is adopted to clarify that it applies only to in-person meetings. Uh, is there any further discussion on item SP1, which has now been amended? I, uh, Councilman Reed? Well, I don't know if this is maybe the proper time, but I guess I, I would like to place a special order of business that would uh, create uh, similar regulations for all of our board committee and committee commission members uh, on the uh, next agenda, uh, as well as I think it makes sense to provide. Uh, I, I heard from either Kelly or Nick just now that our health department is working on securing tests. I think that's uh, a, a wonderful uh, use of ARPA funds. I also wonder um, if if we should have KN95 masks. I think, you know, the vaccines are great uh, and effective for protecting us uh, personally, uh, but I wonder if KN95 masks uh, are uh, really good at protecting folks from other folks, um, you know, making sure that we're keeping whatever sickness we have to ourselves. And so I wonder if that should be included here as well, and we should, we should provide KN95 masks for these meetings, uh, showing that the science is that the cloth masks are not effective. Okay, well, I'm happy to, I don't think that motion is in order right now because uh, there's a motion on the table, but um, I'm happy to, first of all, I'm happy to just do that. Uh, but if you prefer to do it by vote, I'm happy to also call on you as soon as we complete voting on item SP1. Sure. So, um, is there any other discussion on item SP1? Um, seeing none, uh, would the clerk please call the roll on item SP1, which again, recall, was amended by council member Burns to clarify that it applies that the testing requirement applies specifically for in-person meetings. Um, I'm just going to start from council member Kelly since Fleming is not on. Uh, council member Kelly? Aye. Council member Braithwaite? Aye. Council member Wynn? Aye. Council member Newsma? Aye. Council member Burns? Aye. Council member Sufferton? Aye. Council member Bravell? Aye. Council member Reed. Aye. With eight voting in favor and none voting against the motion passes. Um, Council member Reed, did you want to make a motion regarding? Yes, uh, yes. I, I move uh, that we place a special order of business on the February 14th meeting agenda that would uh, provide a um, testing and vaccine, testing and or vaccine requirement uh, for our uh, board committee and commission members, as well as uh, a, a requirement that uh, mirrors our staff requirement for our city clerk. Um, and I would, you know, I, I don't know if I put that, but I would love to see, you know, some ARPA funds or just city funds used uh, for uh, both KN95, to make KN95 masks available to both uh, committee members, council members, and the public who are attending uh, in-person in -person meetings, as well as uh, potential test for committee members. But I'll, I'll certainly put in the uh, KN95 mask. I think we should expend uh, uh, funds to provide KN95 mask uh, for in-person meetings. Second. All right. Council Member Reed moves to place an item on the February 14th agenda to as a special order of business to establish a uh, analogous um, mandate to what was just passed for members of boards, committees, and commissions. Uh, to establish a mandate for the city clerk that parallels the mandate for employees um, and to um, provide KN95 masks uh, for um, in-person public meetings, let's say. 
Uh, Councilmember Burns seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing I, the, oh. I'm raising my hand. I, right, I mean, ahead. unless I'm missing something, this is almost a bit performative. I think we're all clear on the direction we need to go. I would, I don't think I need to have to have another round of discussion. Why don't we just direct our staff to harmonize it across the board and when it's ready, we can vote. But to vote to buy masks, I, I, I'm just trying to be protective of our time. So I'm, I'm a no, not because I disagree, just that this is a simple measure that we can push to our staff. That doesn't mean taking additional meeting time to state the obvious. So the way I understand it, this is just a motion to make sure we can discuss not only the masks, uh, which was I'm only one. I interject, I think this, let's just want to make sure everyone speaks when called on, otherwise we're going to have a mess. Um, All right, well, my raise my, he else is trying to raise <laughs> Um I always check that before I do that. No, I was just going to say that, um, again, that was only, the, the masks is only a part of the motion. I think it makes it clear that we want to discuss all three items at our next meeting as opposed to keeping it open because it's so straightforward, to your point, Councilman Braithwaite. If we're not going to do it today, which I think was the consensus here, um, certainly among people who, who, who spoke, let's address it at our next meeting. So I think that's what this motion does. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further discussion, would the clerk please call the roll on the motion to create the special order of business on the February 14th agenda. Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Braithwaite? I'm a no, and I'm only explaining in the event that someone watches this later that we don't need to vote on something that's more of an operational function that can be managed by staff. So that's why I'm a no. Council Member Wynn? Aye. Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Sufferden? Aye. Council Member Ravel? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Seven voting in favor and one voting against. The motion passes and this item will be a special order of business on the February 14th City Council agenda. Um, that brings us now um, to item SP2 on our agenda, um, which is an item for discussion. Would someone like to make a motion to uh, facilitate discussion on this? I'll move item SP2 on my view. I don't know. I'll move item SP2, um, a discussion of hazard pay for grocery workers. Is there a second? Second. Councilmember Reed moves item SP2. Councilmember Burns uh, seconds. Um, you know, raise your hand if you want to be a part of the discussion. I'll, I'll start by um, asking Councilmember Reed if he wants to make an introduction or provide any opening comments. Yeah, uh, I'll certainly uh, ask staff to uh, walk us through uh, some of the research that the law department did a bit. Uh, but uh, again, what I'm looking at looking to solve here is uh, a few months ago uh, we put forward a, uh, a hazard pay uh, bill and the council uh, at the time uh, given where we thought things were heading decided to reject that bill um, as we have seen uh, conditions have changed uh, you know there have uh, been more hospitalizations um, you know the rise of the Omicron variant it's all stuff that we're aware of um, and now we uh, found ourselves back uh, in a predicament uh, where, uh, um, you know, we have a similar concern for our front uh, line workers, um, you know, based on, you know, Chicago public schools closing temporarily um, because of the rise of Omicron, which uh, certainly uh, has had an impact on workers here in Evanston. Uh, the, uh, you know, there is the potential uh, for, for our schools to do that um, at, at some point. Um, and so, uh, with that, I think we should, uh, there's a version of the hazard pay bill uh, in the agenda now. I, I think we should adopt this for uh, a, a version of it uh, for uh, future emergencies that occur um, where uh, our workers are either putting themselves in increased hazard 
or an increased or, or, or a mix of increased hazard and increased uh, burden due to, as I said, potentially schools closing and increased child care costs. And I think that burden uh, should not be on the city to provide that, but I think on the employers, uh, you know, that are uh, that are providing essential services. Um, so I, I'll ask uh, the law department to talk about some of the legal analysis, as I know that was a, a concern. Um, uh, again, I just want to reiterate that this bill would only affect our large uh, grocery retailers. Uh, I saw in, uh, some information that was sent out earlier um, that D&D Dogs was included as uh, someone that staff asked whether or not they had uh, done hazard pay uh, at all. Uh, and D&D Dog would not be affected by this as I do not believe they have over 500 employees. And this would only impact, again, large grocery retailers uh, and not small uh, you know, mom and pop shops, if you will, like D&D. Your comments? Good evening again, members of City Council, Mayor Biss, uh, Clerk Mendoza, City Manager, Interim City Manager Gendersky, Nicholas Cummings Corporation Council. Um, the law department did uh, get an update on some of the litigation that was pending at the time, the, the last time the City Council considered this ordinance. And most of the litigation, if not all of it, actually favors the uh, governing body that issued such an ordinance. The only question that the law department has not been able to find an answer for is um, this is the only this is this will be the only instance where we found an ordinance very very uh, narrow in scope. So, for example, um, the previous the other lawsuits that we researched uh, dealt with all or a, a greater number of businesses of a certain size and not just specifically grocers. Um, I, I don't know and I can't answer with any sort of. Uh, uh, reasonable clarity if if that would be uh, an issue uh, with respect to equal protection I don't believe that it would be um, the, the court in the federal court in one of the um, in one of the cases I believe it was uh, California um, I'm sorry it was uh, Seattle the federal court rejected uh, an equal protection claim with respect to narrowing in only to grocery stores so I believe that it would uh, still be a valid ordinance uh, but I, I can't say it with any certainty. And again, this has not been done yet in Illinois, um, although there is no law in Illinois that says that this would be an uh, overreaching exercise of the city's home rule authority. We have been unable to find anything definitively that says either way that this that uh, it's either preempted or anything like that. So uh, if the city council decides it wants to go this way, we can say that it's likely that it would, would stand up uh, based upon the research that we have. Uh, but we can't say with any certainty because it hasn't been tested in our particular area just yet. This is mostly something that's gone on in the Ninth Circuit um, and on the West Coast generally. And if I can just add, uh, this is modeled uh, after the Seattle bill. Um, and so uh, it, it's been, so to, to his point, it's been tested. Uh, this, a very close model to this has been tested in federal courts, albeit as Nick said, a different district, but uh, in federal courts and has held up. Uh, the last thing I'll add is uh, I, I don't recall seeing information about uh, the economic impact. There is a, a cup manager, Gandersky, uh, also included a Zen City uh, analysis, um, which uh, shows that uh, of the folks who they're able to get data from, majority are in favor of this. Um, but the biggest concern is on the economic impact. And again, uh, again, I don't know if staff uh, has this, but what we've seen in those cities that have implemented it, um, what my research shows is that there was not some mass exodus of the grocery retailers or businesses, and it did not cause, uh, you know, the economic depression that folks uh, were, were concerned about. So those two major facts are, um, are addressed. We, we, we did not have that in this particular memo. It was uh, focused purely on the legal portion, so I apologize. However, um, uh, Council Member Reed's uh, uh, statement is, is well taken, um, and I believe that the last time we uh, looked at this, certain retailers in the city of Evanston have paid, like Target was one, one of them as an example, had already paid uh, hazard pay to their employees, at least in 2020. I'm not sure about 2021. I have not looked at that, but I do know that um, Target at the very least was one of the retailers, for example, that had paid in 2020. Thank you. Is there a discussion from other members of council? Uh, we'll begin with Council Member Burns. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the question for me on, on all of this is, 
um, similar to even the minimum wage, right, that creates this minimum standard, is there, should we apply a minimum standard in circumstances where there is this emergency, where schools and other institutions are saying um, to their members, don't come to this building because it's, it's an emergency, right? Don't come to this building, stay home. Um, and yet still some, some of our employers are saying, no, you still need to go to work because we'll have a bunch of people at home that still need to, um, uh, to, to shop at our businesses in particular because they are home. In that circumstance, should we create a minimum standard that says, all right, if that does take place, here's the minimum standard of what you need to pay people on top of, um, you know, their, their regular, uh, hourly rates. And so that's the, that's the question and whether if we're willing to entertain it, I think we should do it now. Um, especially knowing that some of these, uh, some of the legal challenges, um, um, were not accepted that, uh, we should just try to determine like if we want to get involved in that, what that minimum standard looks like, what, circumstance would have to present itself for it to apply and then make the decision now so that in the future we don't have to keep going back and forth on whether or not we're going to, you know, we're going to provide hazard pay. Just what is the identified hazard that we want to say reaches that threshold where we need to, to step in and create a minimum standard and we either want to get involved at that level or not. But that's that's the question that I have. and I'd love to hear from, from other colleagues about that. Thank you. Council Member Braithwaite. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I think my thoughts are consistent the last time that we brought this around. I, 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 I do understand the gesture and in, in, in the goal of what Council Member Reed is suggesting and Council Member Burns maybe for suggesting it. But my comments are still the same. I think all businesses right now, we realize that institutions are suffering from the pandemic. Um, I think it's unfair to make assumptions about any industry without having that conversation. I challenge you, Council Member Reed, to have that discussion with your stores that would be impacted to find out what they're doing. I can tell you direct, and I take a lot of pride. I think the two stores that people go to, both Valley as well as Food for Less, are stores that many residents in Evanston across the town find to be very affordable. And, and they're all well-run businesses. And when you speak to them individually, and I have, they are all paying a very decent wage to many of their employees because of a lot of reasons. First of all, employment right now, it's, it's an employee market. So they have to pay their uh, employees, council member Reed, a higher wage just to stay competitive. And they're constantly dealing with the battle of an employee who will leave uh, at a moment's notice for a dollar extra. And so what they've explained is in order to maintain a consistency is they do pay that higher wage right now. The other interesting fact that, again, in order to keep their food affordable, um, they are dealing with higher wages they're also dealing with supply chain. I think for any of us both uh, who shops on the line or, or council like, we've all noticed that the price of food has gone up. So at the, at the end of the day, should we pass this, which I don't think makes sense to just single out this one industry, it's completely unfair. At the end of the day, we're gonna end up paying more than we're already paying. And so if the goal is to impact those that need the assistance, I would also challenge you to think about the residents who shop at these stores and rely on the affordable prices so they can uh, support their families. So at the end of the day, I'm a definite no. Um, I, th I think it's a good gesture, but it's completely unfair. And I don't think it's the role of our local government to pass this type of of uh, burden onto our businesses, particularly when the ones that I've spoken to uh, share that their businesses can not absorb it. And, and it does put at risk to really good stores that provide affordable food for our whole town and nearby suburbs at risk uh, to if we move forward with this. Thank you. Council Member Burns. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cummings, you had your hand up for a while. Just did. No, no, it's, it's fine. Um, I was just going to point out that um, previously this was tied to the phases of the state. Um, I don't foresee the governor taking us be out of phase five. So uh, it would need to be amended to, to Council Member Burns' point to when this would be triggered. Um, that would be up for the council to determine when it would be triggered uh, because it, it, wouldn't, it couldn't be tied to the phases anymore. Thank you. That's a good point. Is there further discussion on this? Uh, well, I was just going to quickly say, or, or, or it could, and that's my point, is that um, we don't have to, I'm not thinking about this in something that has to apply today right now, and, and I may um, differ from Councilmember Reed in that. I'm just saying if there has been a period at any point during this pandemic where we feel um, that it would have been helpful for government to step in and, and create that minimum standard um, during these emergencies and, and, and during uh, hazardous times for our employees, then we should establish it. We don't have to make this policy work for now we, we could tie it to the phases and if we ever go back to one of those phases, it would apply, but at least we know how we would deal with that in the future. Yeah, my, my yeah. thought. Hold on like, one second. I mean, Can, Councilmember uh, Braithwaite, is your hand uh, back up or is? No, no. All right, so then uh, Councilmember council member Reed in that case. Yes, um, with, with, with that in mind, um, you know, I, I, I certainly agree. I, I, it wouldn't be tied to the previous phases uh, that was very specific to that period of time. I think the uh, the what I'm what I envision tying it to is emergency declarations by the governor, the mayor, or uh, uh, local school closings in our area. Um, you know, 65202 or uh, the larger one next to us. Um, and so I, I think that those would be um, what would trigger this. So I think even um, you know, in in my eyes. A, a terrible blizzard um, that you know, impacted the city for a few days where maybe schools were closed, but grocery workers still had to go to work and they had to find child care and all of these you know, burdens that are you know, in the hazard of traveling through that snow to go to work to ensure that you know, the folks who need to get groceries have access to that. Uh, you know, my vision is that this would apply uh, to that as well, as well as the, the COVID-19 if we, some new, uh, whatever the last letter in the Greek, uh, the alphabet is, I should know. But, uh, you know, if that comes up, you know, and that's a bad variant, then, uh, you know, we're, we're prepared for that and we don't have to have this discussion again. And I think it's really sad, you know, that, uh, you know, someone like Mr. Vasoko looks at this body and, and I think this might be shared amongst more people that looks at this body and says, we do not care about our, uh, you know, low wage, our frontline workers. And, and that's not the vision that I have of our city. That's not the vision I want residents and our workers to look at this government and think that we do not care about them, uh, you know, because, you know, we're not willing to pay a penny extra. I mean, if we think about what this means, you know, you pay a penny more, maybe, maybe for your, your, your bag of rice, um, because, you know, we're giving workers a two to four dollar um, hazard pay bonus during uh, times where they're working in extreme hazard. I think it, I think it makes sense. Thank you, yes. Mayor Biss. I'm sure I'm out of time. I was just going to flag that your time your time is up, um, um, and Councilmember Wynn is next. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I I did want to address this because uh, I did uh, speak out on this before. I think for the reasons that Councilmember Braithwaite has raised, which were raised before, uh, which is that you know these are these are businesses in our community that we really value, uh, even though they may have 500 employees, they do provide very good service and they employ a lot of Evanstonians. And absent having a serious discussion with them, I can't support this because I haven't heard their viewpoint on this. Uh, they, uh, it, it's, we take into consideration all stakeholders when we make decisions like this. And I don't think they have had the opportunity to come forward and have a discussion with us. Uh, on the issue of making this, uh, some kind of uh, a, a blanket hazard pay looking forward, I don't think that that's good policy. Uh, this hazard pay has been carefully tailored to the specifics of this emergency. And 
I don't know how we would determine um, what the next hazard would be. I don't, I, I, blizzards are bad, but what is a bad blizzard? Uh, you know, we know that over near the lakefront, we can get uh, four feet of snow, uh, whereas out at the Edens, it's uh, maybe six or eight inches. Uh, that's, I, I think we're trying to predict the future in a way that is casting the net way, way too wide. So I, I would not be able to support some um, vague idea of what a future hazard is. I think that's not good policy. So for the reasons that I stated, I am, I'm not going to support this tonight. Point of uh, order or point of information, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Um, to, to be clear, I forget what the term is, uh, a straw man argument, uh, sorry. Uh, I, the, the, um, what, what I stated there is this isn't a vague or a wide uh, net that's being cast. Um, I, I think I very clearly said that this would be tied to emergency declarations. Uh, as, uh, as I said in Councilmember Burns, I think uh, uh, said as well, that you know, this is when we are saying right now we know there's an emergency. We're not physically in a building. <laughs> We're not coming to go sit next to each other and and smile at each other uh, a few feet away because we understand there's an emergency. Uh, and so when there's an emergency declaration by the governor, the mayor, um, or our, our schools are closed, uh, which are clear, defined emergencies, not just a few feet of snow, not just you know whatever. It's there's something at a government order. Uh, in place, that is when this would kick in. So I just want to clarify that and, you know, not leave it uh, as a blanket. It's, Thank you. Is there, is there any further discussion on this matter? All right, seeing none, thank you very much. I want to thank. So thank is, the, is the step to, does this automatically move forward to the next meeting for introduction? Uh, that was, uh, you know, what we had, the discussion that we had before is that we're going to put this on for discussion um, so uh, we could have three readings of it. You know, that would allow that time that Councilmember Wynn and others are looking to talk to our businesses. And I often hear businesses brought up as folks we need to talk to. Uh, I've never heard workers, the actual people who make the businesses run brought up as folks that we need to talk to. So I'm just wondering, uh, do we need to vote to move this uh, for introduction at the next meeting or yeah, this will automatic not automatically one. appear on the agenda as it currently stands. And sorry, I see a hand, uh, Councilmember Kelly's hand is up. So I just, could you explain how this works if something's brought up discussion when it goes on to introduction? I mean, does it always require a vote? And... Well, I was about to answer and then the Corporation Council raised his hand, which is great news. So Nick, why don't you uh... <laughs> I was gonna say, if you wanna explain, Mr. Mayor, you can go ahead. Um, I, was off, I was volunteering to help out. Um, essentially, because it was brought as a special order of business, um, you know, we as a discussion item, we would as staff would need direction as to where it should go next. You guys can sit it, refer it to a particular committee if you'd like, um, or it can come back to this body. But even if it comes back to this body, it would still come through some committee before it actually appears on this council agenda, unless it comes back as a special order of business, which will require a vote similar to the one you just had about uh, setting um, uh, additional rules for our board's commissions and committees. So if the direction is for us to bring you a draft, um, it will still likely to go to some committee. Uh, I'm, I'm not clear which one. I don't know if it will go to P&D or, or rules or um, even APW. Um, however, it would probably go through a committee first and before it comes back to city council uh, like other ordinances in this instance. Council Member Burns. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind seeing this go to a committee if I understood like what committee it would go to. Development makes sense. Because um, what I what I um, what I don't think is appropriate is to just apply kind of arbitrary requests for involvement from any stakeholder group without really describing how that will work. And so, if we when every time we say that from now on, if we're saying, hey. That's it should go to a committee, and that is the space where we're going to formally invite uh, businesses in this case, but uh, stakeholder groups to participate in the discussion. They're great, um, but I don't think I don't get collecting feedback that individually is the way to, to get feedback. Having Councilmember Braithway having his own conversations with businesses and uh, Reed having his own, I don't think is a productive way to to get that feedback. Um, so again, I would certainly. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I don't mind making a referral for this to go to the Economic Development Committee or uh, making a motion, a motion um, for this to go to the Economic Development Committee. I just I want to make sure for Councilmember Braithwaite, Councilmember Wynn, and anybody else that holds that opinion that we need to uh, to, to uh, we need to hear from our business community, which I share that opinion that that is the venue where that can happen, and that we're going to invite businesses to participate in the discussion, to attend meetings, to share their opinion with the with the entire committee as opposed to just on one-off conversations. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I, I would say, I mean, my own take is, and I know it's kind of weird, I'm the guy who's not on committees, but, but yeah, I think that is the purpose of the committee process to have those more serious, engaged processes with stakeholders and, um, and allow everybody to, to, to have, you know, the same information from the same people and, and then make their own decisions based on a shared, whoa, everybody uh based on a shared set of facts um so i think you know to the extent that that's what folks think is the appropriate way to handle an issue of this complexity i would say yeah it should, I, I would suggest a motion to send it to a committee rather than bringing it back as a special order of business for a vote because i think then we're just back on the same treadmill where we get back here and everyone's had their one-off conversations and i think that that winds up pretty frustrating for folks I'll move that this go to economic development. So council member Reed moves to refer this item to the economic development committee for further discussion and study. Um, is there a second to that motion? Second. Council member Burns seconds. Is there any discussion on the motion to refer this to the economic development committee? Uh, seeing none, uh, will the clerk please call the roll. Sorry, Clerk Mendoza, I don't know if you're muted. Oh, yep, you are. Yes, I am. Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Braithwaite? No. Council Member Wynn? No. Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Sufferden? I believe you're also muted if you're there. Council member Sufferden. Not here. Um, Council member Ravel. No. Council member Reed. Aye. So on this matter, there are four voting in favor and three voting opposed. And I'm almost sure that this is the kind of vote where a simple majority is adequate so i believe a four to three vote constitutes passage mr cummings can you just make sure i'm not freelancing here on procedure or at least not freelancing incorrectly on procedure i guess i'm that is it, it is correct i'm just confused why there's an odd number because i i think there's eight members, number so one of the members on the roll was stepped away and okay okay yes um it just requires a simple majority vote all right, so with, with four voting in favor and three voting against this item, the motion passes and the item has been referred to the Economic Development Committee for further uh, further discussion and study. Um, that brings us to the consent agenda. Um, are there items that folks would like to see removed from the consent agenda? My understanding was that uh, there was an item on the P and D agenda that did not um, did not come up for a vote. Is that correct, Mr. Right. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, so that's that was the HC one. Okay, so HC one we're pulling off. Sorry, mate. HC one. Um, I've gotten a lot of. Uh, questions about this so um r1 okay so hc1 r1 i think the one i mentioned is p1 is that correct chair yeah that's right p1 so so far i have p1 hc1 and r1 and, and so, so p1 is just off the agenda right but i 
I think we have to remove it from the consent agenda just okay because it still appears it appears on the agenda that was released to the public so if we don't remove it it okay it'll be as though we're trying to pass a thing that never even really got here which presents a metaphysical challenge i'm not prepared to speak right. to right. okay. and, and then r2 if i didn't say that uh you did not so this time i have p1 r1 r2 and hc1 Anything else? Uh, seeing none, I would entertain a motion uh, to pass the consent agenda, save those uh, four items. I move to pass the consent agenda. Second. Second. So council member Wynn moves the approval of the consent agenda with <clears throat> P1, R1, R2, and HC1 uh, removed. Uh, I think council member Reed seconded, I wanna say. Is there yes. a discussion? Uh, seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. Councilmember Wynn? Aye. Councilmember Nuthma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Sefferton? Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. So seven voting in favor and none voting against. The consent agenda without P1, R1, R2, and HC1 passes. Um, we, the first item we pulled off is P1, which as Chair Ravel indicated is, uh, is not, um, not gonna come up for a vote uh, tonight at council. So that moves us to R1. Uh, Chair Reed, would you like to make a motion regarding R1? Yeah, I'll move adoption of uh, uh, adoption of resolution 7R 22 amending the city code rule 14.3 to require the mayor to announce mayoral veto at the city council meeting uh, immediately uh, following a issuance of a veto. Is there a second? I'll second. Council member Reed moves item R1, council member Kelly seconds. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I just want to note uh, for folks about the yeah, I'm sorry. I just want to note for folks that uh, that this simply uh, uh, requires the mayor to announce a veto. It's pretty straightforward uh, in the case that one is ent entered, uh, so there's no confusion between something that was passed at council and then seemingly adopted and then later on, um, uh, you know, vetoed. It, it should be made clear to both the council and the public uh, when that is done uh, to provide additional clarity on the actions of the government. Uh, and we adopted this in rules, uh, and so. Looking forward to adopting it again. Is there a further discussion on item R1? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Braithwaite? Aye. Council Member Wynn? Aye. Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Um, Council Member Suffered and let me know he will not be here. Um, he had to step off. Um, Council Member Ravel? Aye. And Council Member Reed? Aye. Seven voting in favor and none voting against. Item R1 passes. Uh, and that brings us Aye. to item R2. Uh, Chair Reed, would you like to make a motion? Yeah, I'll move ordinance 90, I'm sorry, 9022, um, amending Title II, Chapter 17 of the Evanston City Code to allow members of the reparations committee to receive benefits from the reparations fund. Is there a second? Second. second. Council <coughs> member Reed moves item R2. Council member Braithwaite seconds. Is there any discussion on this matter? Yes, I, I just want to provide Council clarity. Member Reed. It, oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, I just want to provide clarity. I, I think because I think this is important, reparations is, is important. Um, making sure that the community is on the same page with us, uh, with reparations as much as possible is important. So I just want to take a second to explain why I'm supporting this. And um, again, reparations, you know, if we're going to say that members of the reparations committee are conflicted from serving on that committee and receiving a benefit, then everyone from the plan commission, from the arts council, from anything that deals with public works, we all benefit uh, or are detrimented by our zoning code, by our 
um, you know, any of the public works that we do. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think one, the idea that folks who are on this committee couldn't receive a benefit um, from the work of this committee doesn't necessarily apply. It's not direct payments to someone's business or we're giving contracts, we're creating a, a, a code, a structure for, uh, uh, you know, transparently delivering repair uh, to a certain number of folks who uh, meet a certain criteria that has been developed before uh, the creation of this committee. Um, and I also think particularly with reparations work, with equity work, you want the folks who are most directly impacted um, by um, a harm to be leading the efforts to correcting the harm. And so I think it, you know, makes sense to have folks who are directly impacted uh, and who would potentially, you know, fall into that ancestor or even descendant category uh, making this, this rule. I mean, I am a descendant uh, under the reparations. I've not applied reparations, but should I be conflicted off of the committee because this, um, you know, I could potentially uh, benefit from this. I think Alderman Braithwaite as well as would meet the direct descendant criteria as well as former Alderman Ruth Simmons. I think it's important to have folks who meet that uh, criteria uh, leading, um, and particularly when we're talking about seniors um, who have faced this kind of racial discrimination, it's important to have them in the driver's seat. And I very much value uh, our, our seniors and ancestors who are serving on this committee. So I hope we can, I know we're going to adopt this, but I hope the community can understand that this is not some ethical conflict um, you know, in and of itself. Um, so we'll just watch the process to make sure that we build a good process that does not create real conflicts. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cummings? Just wanted to um, also inform the public, Councilmember Reed asked uh, the law department the implications of the state law with respect to this. Uh, so we had an opportunity to do that research after the Rules Committee. Um, there is no implication of state law in terms of a conflict of interest. Uh, the, the benefits would be available to any member of the community that's eligible, uh, just as it is available to members of the committee. So there would be no issue. The members of the committee just could not vote to give themselves the benefit. Um, and that's that's the same with uh, anything, any other conflict of interest that's uh, for any member, any elected official or any other member of or commissioner or committee when it comes to like city contracts or anything like that, um, simply cannot be the person to actually vote in favor of that uh, of receiving that benefit. And so uh, Councilmember Reed uh, asked us to look into that. We did, and there is no implication for state law. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Thank you, Nick. I just want to provide some, hopefully some, some clarity and, and simplify it in that I think sometimes these conflicts um, are applied a lot more stricter than they're meant to. So, and in many cases, most cases, the conflict doesn't prohibit you from participating in the body. It just means you need to disclose any conflicts, right, and recuse yourself appropriately. So I just want to say that plainly, that that's all that's being done here. Um, again, in, in most cases, if not all, but certainly in, in most, it, there's, there's not many conflicts that could prohibit you from participating in, in, in the body. It just means you need to disclose it and recuse yourself when appropriate. So that's all that's being done here. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Council Member Kelly. Yeah, so um, as I expressed in rules, I, I just think, you know, it's so important. Um, reparations is so incredibly important that locally, statewide and nationally, and since we're, you know, setting um, ground front on this, it's so important that we, you know, exercise the utmost due diligence in in, um, in ensuring, you know, the highest levels of ethical standards and transparency in process. So I would just ask maybe go, and Bobby, to your point, you know, I agree, disclosure, re recusal is in a sense, you're sort of removing yourself from a certain process. So I just, I think that maybe going forward, it might be worth, I'm going to vote for this. I support this, but I do think going forward, there might be a tighter way to do this. Um, uh, to make this, um, I think, um, a stronger process. Um, and I also think, I also have questions regarding, I, I think we need to be as transparent as possible regarding those selected. Um, it's just so important. This is so important, I believe so deeply in reparations. 
I don't want to see this fail. So I ask that we really examine this deeply um, to see how we can strengthen this going forward and look at really the, the selection process and who's on the committee. And I, I don't think it, it's wonderful we've moved forward on this, but I don't think it means we have to necessarily going forward, um, you know, adhere and stick to what we've started. It should it should evolve in a way that's healthy and that strengthens our reparations program. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Councilmember Burns' hand is back up, um, but first I want to see, is there anybody who hasn't yet spoken who wanted to um, engage in this discussion? Uh, seeing none, Councilmember Burns for a second round. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Councilmember Kelly. And like in any other case, rec rec recusal is needed for a specific question where you are conflicted out directly. So again, as I think Council Cummings mentioned, if if there was a question on whether or not uh, if there was a vote on whether or not a uh, committee member, reparations committee member, um, uh, should receive or would receive a benefit, if that was the question before the committee, that would be different. Like if, you know, but one, that's not how, at least in this first round, these benefits are being decided. But in that circumstance, uh, the committee member will recuse himself, but not withdraw themselves from the entire body. That's like, I mean, even council members here, um, you know, uh, have recused themselves on certain specific questions, but they didn't withdraw themselves from the entire body. So I'm just saying just cause for that, which is what I've heard from community members, doesn't really line up to the way, you know, we, we handle conflicts in Evans. And, and most, if not all bodies, handle conflicts. Councilmember Kelly. So, sure. I just meant recusal is removing yourself from a particular um, event or process within a larger one. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on item R2? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Braithwaite? Aye. Council Member Wynn? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. With seven voting in favor and none voting against, item R2 passes. That brings us to item HC1. Would someone like to make a motion on item HC1? Yeah, I'll make the motion. Uh, I removed it. Approval of renewal contract for landlord tenant services with Metropolitan Tenants Organization and Lawyers Committee for Better Housing um, for January 1, 2022 through December 31st, 2022. Is there a second? Second. Councilmember Burns moves item HC1. Councilmember Bell seconds. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Burns. Yeah, I removed this. We, we had a, um, a discussion about this in the um, I think it's ACDC. I always forget what that stands for. Councilmember Bell, you might be to help me out. Housing and Community Development Committee. Housing and Community Development Committee. There it is. Um, and and so what I noticed is that one voice, which is the most important voice in this decision, is missing, which is tenants. We haven't conducted any you know surveys um, um, of tenants and. Um, and I, and I, I don't think the uh, MTO has, has done so either, although even if they had, I think it makes more sense for us to conduct those uh, surveys ourselves. Um, and what I and Sarah and I uh, have talked about this, Sarah Flex and I have talked about this, um, what I'm proposing, and I didn't know whether or not I should do it within this um, motion or separate, but what's happening is when someone calls in the 311 and says hey i have a landlord tenant dispute we're not capturing who that person is and how we can get in touch with them we're immediately forwarding that person over to mto and so we're losing that opportunity to capture that information so we could at a later uh, event reach out and and ask some some questions about the quality of um of the program and so I would like to see just really, I think we should do this um, in any similar situation where we contract out for, for this type of, for similar work, 
But at least for this, for now, if we can just uh, provide some clear direction that we would like, you know, just basic information, first name, last name, email, and best contact phone to be included when people to be captured, uh, you know, at the moment that the um, tenant is requesting support from our 311 team that we capture really quickly. And then we make the, the referral to MTO or, or whomever we're contracting with at, at that time. So again, I, I meant Mayor Bitch to reach out to you about this. Um, I don't know if that's a motion. I wanna make sure, the reason why I thought it might be a motion is because I wanna make sure that this just becomes standard policy, that it's a, a few years from now that we start doing things differently. Cause it, again, we're missing opportunities to, to get really good feedback. So uh, again, I'm happy to make a motion on this. Um, and Sarah, I don't know if you want to jump in, but we, we talked about this and, and she's in support and thinks it will be helpful to do this. Sure, if I could um, just say a couple of things. Thank you, um, Council Member Burns, and uh, thank you, Mayor Biss, and other council members, and Clerk Mendoza. Um, we have been talking about getting, um, it's a quality control, and it's making sure that we're actually addressing the things that people need. And we do get some some of the people who contact 311 are um, actually um, put through a regular 311 request, you know, through the system. And we do capture um, either their phone number or their email, sometimes both. So we have some of them, but, but a number are just, you know, literally transferred. Um, I talked with John um, um, Bartlett, who is very much fine with us wanting to do follow-up research, and he said that he could certainly help by providing the contact information they have for the people who are from Evanston as well. So we could work it two ways. But I think that Councilmember Burns thought that we should just always try to get um, a basic name, phone number, and maybe an email uh, could be a very helpful thing. And it would allow us to um, get do better ongoing surveys, kind of like how, you know, sometimes you're um, on a helpline or something like that and they say hey if you were um, you know would you when you finish your um, being taken care of be willing to do a quick survey you know um, a lot of us say no but it is an ongoing way that people can get um, you know feedback and 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 uh, make sure that uh, the process is going well so we really want to try to do something along those lines and I think that it is better if the city can take on the responsibility for for doing the follow-up and, and not expect that of the um, MTO or any other nonprofit that we might be working with um, that we want to do this kind of just you know check to see how our services are and are they taking care of people um, and how so oh sorry councilmember Ravel um, well, I agree with um, the idea of uh, contacting the folks who call uh, for the MTO services and, you know, learning what their experience is and, you know, that could provide some information for possible improvement. Um, I guess I see that as a city process issue that we can do, that we should do, um, but it's independent of the motion before us, which is to renew the contract with MTO for the um, tenant landlord services. So I, um, we could make, you know, a, approve the vote on the contract. And then also if we need, if we need a motion, I don't know that a motion is needed to direct city staff to set up a process, but I, I guess I see them as complementary, but, but separate um, issues. Let, let me ask Kelly to weigh in on that second question. I think certainly they're, they're, they're separate issues. Um, um, Kelly, do, does staff have enough direction from this to address the, the process issue at, at 311? Um, or is it, would the appropriate next step be for there to be a motion made on the council floor? I think staff has enough direction. I think so. And, and again, I, I think I just want to make sure it becomes like a standard practice. And that's my, my concern is that when leadership changes happen, um, I just don't want to, this to get lost. And so if it, it takes council to say, this council needs to say, look, we would like to see this done uh, permanently, then that's a different 
response than than leaving it open. I'm really concerned about leaving it open because as as those who um, uh, uh, serve with me on 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 some other committees on, uh, committees, I'm big on data because it allows us to to really take um, better act, action on these decisions right now. Because let me color this for you. Um, we're being asked to extend a contract and we haven't heard from the very group that is impacted by whether or not MTO continues to provide this, these services. We haven't heard from them at all. And one could say that's a good thing, right? If they had issues, they would let us know, but I don't, I don't think that's the best way to, to make those decisions. A lot of people get really, um, 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 I've heard folks in my residence say they, they stop interacting with the city and, reaching out if they get disheartened by certain things that I, I was talking to a gentleman the other day who said, I don't even call the city about property standards issues. I just feel like it won't be addressed. So I don't think we should assume that because we're not hearing anything from residents that everything is fine. We should really have a process and not just for this particular contract, but they all contracts that impact um, residents directly. We should hear from them. So, so we can evaluate what they're saying before we make, uh, approved contract extensions. I'm certainly happy to approve this today, but I brought it up now because I really would like that to see that in place. So I would have the confidence to know when this comes back or a similar contract comes back that, that it will be a requirement moving forward that we have some information from the groups that are directly impacted. Uh, Council member Reed followed by Kelly. Yes, I just want to second what uh, Council Member Burns is saying. Uh, I think we do need to institutionalize uh, reaching out to uh, vulnerable and impacted communities. I also do want to state that, especially, you know, to heighten his point, that especially when we're talking about folks who are dealing with uh, these kind of rental issues that we know tend to be lower income, tend to be uh, folks who are struggling, these are the folks who are least likely uh, just in the first place to reach out uh, to government. So I think we should do special care to make sure that we're actually particularly when we're spending this kind of money that we're actually getting a good bang for the service. So I have had some residents uh, uh, in, in my ward who have, uh, you know, had mixed bag experiences, good, good uh, assistance from our, our partners and then also uh, not so great. Uh, but I think we need to do an, a, a citywide and institution wide uh, survey of this to get real understanding. Thank you. Also remember Kelly. Yeah, so I agree. I, I also want to second that, that it's really important that we, it's part of the problem when you outsource, um, and I know, you know, these agencies are doing a great job, but we, we need to keep our finger on the pulse um, of the conditions of the tenants. And so I agree, you should be at, we need to get thorough reports to effectively represent. Thank you. Um, I guess the question is whether there's a constructive motion to be made now and whether what impact it would have. You know, I don't think we have the tools to pass an ordinance off the top of our head changing our procurement process. Um, so I don't know if the right thing is to ask staff to come back with something or to allow these 311 decisions around tenant issues to provide a model and then, and then we could pass something institutionalizing that model. Uh, but my instinct is that to sort of come up with a motion on the fly right now is not going to actually solve the problem. It would it may feel good, but I don't think it would actually put something in place that would be any more durable than just an abstract conversation. Mayor, if I may, yeah. uh, my, my staff is pretty confident that we can, we can report back and we can get this model set up. Um, so I think it would be great if staff could be given the opportunity to do that before we start trying to pass further ordinances. And when, <laughs> can, when do you yep. think staff can be back with something? Uh, Ms. Flax? Um, well, um, we're kind of swamped right now, but I'd re not want to be back at the next meeting, but probably at the following one, you know, two meetings. And just because, I mean, we've got to talk to Sue Pontarelli and her troops. And, and then I also want to talk about things like how might we, depending on the number of contacts we have in total, how might we institute an ongoing and regular um, follow up because one of the things that we have to realize is, you know, it's not like we get a million calls a day. Um, we, you know, get with MTO someplace in the neighborhood of 35 to 40 cases a month. And so it's not going to be immediately conclusive. Um, and things change over 
periods of time. You know, I mean, we've seen very um, a lot of different um, maintenance used to be our single biggest always the thing that people were calling about. They had maintenance problems. How would they get you know them taken care of? And then you know during the pandemic, we've had a whole lot of things relating to how do I keep from what do I do if I can't pay my rent and all sorts of very different things and you know how can I keep from being evicted so I think that we'll have to sort of do this for a regular period of time we're also not going to get everybody to respond we've talked about probably using text messaging if we can that's been a very successful thing with getting in touch with a lot of people many of our lower income Residents don't have unlimited data packages. They're not real big on doing emails and stuff all the time, and they don't always um, want to use their phone message. You know, they're just their phone usage either. So we've got to expand. We've got to we've got to really see what how we can get to them. But we have a lot of tools um, through our three one one system that we can do um, surveys from. Well, thank you. And just to give the cliff notes, I mean, so, so you think February twenty eighth is a a realistic time to come back. In, um, in an alternative, we can also provide a weekly report in the city manager's report that goes out every Friday. So that's another option. I don't think we'll see enough change week to week to make that of any real value. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, would it be great to have more than just skip one meeting a little more time that would be great but you know I think it's a question of how urgently um, you want this addressed. Councilmember Burns? Now as you can say it could be kind of uh, implemented as soon as staff is ready. I, I would it is important to be in council commons if you're still on the line that that we come up with some um, you know language where, where a code change can be made. Um, my experience has been and and um, you know, folks can speak for itself as to why, but sometimes there's this aversion against creating ordinances, and I don't see it in that. I, I think it, it's important because it it, it not only um, sets a standard and a requirement for this body, but any future body, and if they want to deviate from that, they have to come back and vote on it. I think that is really important, especially with community engagement efforts, because we don't get enough community engagement. I think we all understand that. Even tonight, right, as we're voting on this contract, we're no, where are the sentence? You know, and so I think very clearly these meetings aren't the best way to get feedback from um, from the groups that are directly impacted. And so we have to find other ways to do it. And it's great that this particular administration is committed to doing it. But I think we need to make sure that that every future council is as well. And if they're not great, they can they can put it on the agenda and, and change it and and um, and explain their, their rationale to. To, to their constituents at that point, but I do I would like to to take a look at uh, an ordinance change for this, and we can look at both, um, and uh, and and certainly okay with it being implemented even before we vote on it if that's the the desire of staff. But we'd like to see an, um, an option for an ordinance change. Yeah, and I want to be clear about my own preference. I'm not I have no opposition at all to passing ordinances on things like this. I, I just I'm a little concerned about making them up live during a meeting and hoping we've got it right. So that, that's where my resistance. No, is. no, no, we can come back for it. I just, in between yeah. you saying that, and there was some confusion on whether or not an ordinance will come back. And so I'm saying, I'm fine with the update. I just want to make sure that a, a draft ordinance comes back that we can at least consider and take a look at. Uh, and, and if we decide at that time, you know, to, to not do that, that's one thing, but I, I would like the opportunity to, to, to take a look at it, see where it would fit in the code for a law, law department, in our law department's opinion, and then go from there. Ms. Flax? A, a note, perhaps we could bring a sort of process back to the Housing and Community Development Committee, at least with MTO, and saying this is, you know, after talking to 311 and say this is what we think we can do and this is, you know, and, you know, with some estimates of the frequency of calls and what kind of follow-up we can do and things like that uh, before it comes back to council. Would that make sense? I'm trying to use our committees and our committee that is most one of the uh, HCDC's responsibilities is really trying to get feedback from um, the people that we're most trying to help with our CDBG and, and our other uh, um, funds that are directed using an equity lens. So I think that it might be really valuable to um, come back to that committee. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that too, Sarah. Great. Great. 
And I think right. February, we could probably at least bring back a discussion and some information. Um, we've got more of a, an agenda in March already because we've got the caper and stuff like that. So maybe that would be a good way of working that out. Great. Sounds good. Thank you very much. That's, uh, okay. I, oh, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to uh, chime in and say, you know, I think that it may be appropriate that a referral is made so we can actually go through the process. Um, if the law department is actually going to be expending resources and to drafting uh, the ordinance and working with community development to get that done, um, to seeing where it would fit in the code appropriately. Yeah, that's a good point. Council Member Burns, could you make a referral tonight? And we'll act on it quickly. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, well, I think this has been a very productive discussion. Uh, still on the floor, though, is the motion to pass the underlying item HC1. And seeing no further discussion, uh, would the clerk please call the roll on item HC1? Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. Councilmember Wynn? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. This matter, there are seven voting in favor and none voting against, and so item HC1 passes. Uh, this brings us to call of the wards. Councilmember Kelly. Um, so we have a series of, please look um, out for the email, series of community meetings coming up about various developments from the Burger King um, site to Chicago Avenue and others. Um, and I think that's it. So we have one meeting and also plan commission or land use commission this Wednesday regarding um, a hearing for the burger for the um, Trammell Crow Burger King development. I hope everybody will try to attend um, so that we can hear your voices. Thank you. Council Member Braithwaite. No report. Council Member Wynn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This Thursday is the third ward town hall meeting. It will be via Zoom uh, this Thursday evening from 7 to 8.30. Anyone is welcome to join, and I look forward to seeing you all. Thank you. Council Member Newsom. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, looking ahead to February, uh, the fourth ward meeting will be Tuesday, February 8th, likely online. Uh, fourth ward residents, please stay tuned. I'll let you know via the newsletter. And uh, office hours, Saturday, February 12th uh, at Reprise Roasters from 10 to 12 in the morning. That's all, thanks. Council Member Burns. Uh, there is January uh, 27, 7 p.m. Uh, we're having a, a virtual or remote um, uh, fifth floor meeting on Google Meet. The information is on the uh, city calendar. Uh, as part of our discussion, we're going to introduce the new leadership at Family Focus. Uh, Dara Munson, who's the president and CEO, and Vanessa Allen Graves, who's the center director. And we're also going to have a presentation from the Evanston Transit Alliance on how to improve bike and walk uh, commuting in the fifth war for students, workers, and residents seeking green space for recreation. And that presentation will be provided by John Fervoil, Fervoy, hopefully I'm pronouncing his name correctly. If not, I apologize, uh, John. And he is a member of Evanston Transit Alliance. Um, that is, that is all. Council member Abel. Uh, no report, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Reed. Yes, uh, I would like to announce uh, there will be an eighth ward meeting also on Thursday. So we're tripling up on Thursday, uh, uh, Thursday from six to seven, our eighth ward meeting uh, or ward night. I'm going to start calling it, uh, and it is uh, virtual as well. Uh, and so that I think should be on the city's website, and we'll get a blast out about that. Uh, to get folks to link. Um, also, I, I want to, I spoke to manager, interim manager Gandersky earlier. There were some uh, um, uh, concerns raised about um, 
the panhandling signs that were put up and I had uh, residents, uh, eighth ward residents uh, reach out to me. I share that concern. I, but after speaking with Manager Gondersky, I have a bit more clarity um, on uh, what the goal is and uh, a fuller picture than what was provided in uh, Evanston now. Um, but I, uh, I do also hope that as we're moving forward with this process, one that we learned from the past, I didn't have uh, the time to pull my gray beard off the mantle, uh, my, my fake gray beard, uh, as Alderman Wynn says. But I, I think I remember from my time as clerk reading uh, something about our history, it may have been the 1920s or 30s, uh, where we also instituted a similar, uh, 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 or not this, not signs that like have hearts and nice things about not paying panhandling, but we in instituted a pretty strict uh, panhandling ordinance, um, and I think there's some backfire to it, and I just don't want, uh, that's not who Evanston is. I, I get the goal of this. We are looking to uh, direct uh, these funds in a productive way and discourage what is illegal here, because my understanding from Ms. Gandersky, from Manager Gandersky, is that panhandling itself is not illegal in the city of Evanston. So I want folks to understand that panhandling is not illegal here, but aggressive panhandling is illegal here. Um, and so I think we need to really educate folks about the difference between aggressive panhandling um, and someone you know uh, who is you know kind of gently asking for change but isn't being aggressive uh, in their in their in their manners of that. And so I think you know particularly whatever signage is going up, I think it needs to be very clear that we're talking about folks who are aggressive, so we don't have more folks. You know, we're just sitting there in the corner um, outside of CVS or wherever the heck it is, Trader Joe's being harassed either by residents or by police. Um, because as as as, um, as, as my uh, colleague on the Equity Empowerment Commission mentioned, uh, Ms. Thomas, uh, that, um, you know, the city, we as a body, we as a city, we as an institution, both locally, state and federally, um, have failed these folks in one way or another, whether it's mental health, poverty support, whatever the case may be, we have failed them and we should not further stigmatize these folks or further add um, to, to confusion. In fact, as someone who was falsely arrested for uh, the panhandling ordinance uh, a couple of years ago, um, you know, I, I, I do understand how easily, um, you know, uh, a misinterpretation of that uh, ordinance can uh, lead to, um, lead to a whole host of things. Uh, so, uh, oh, uh, and that uh, concludes my comments. Thank you. And with that, Councilmember Newsom is recognized for a motion. Uh, already. Somebody have the language in front of me. Usually it's in my drawer underneath the desk and we're not in person here, so. Uh, you, uh, give me a second. Okay. I thought you were always just speaking from the heart. I didn't realize <laughs> the preparation. Um, we we'll make a motion to remove Councilman Manuser from these duties without plans. <laughs> <laughs> I still Council believe Member, Council Member Burns would like to take over. He's more than I'm not ready to. <laughs> um, hold on, executive session. I'm just ready to meet in person. So, so we got all. Well, we got to do this in person or. Virtually. Um, let's see, session. If we were in person, I have my cheat sheet in my in the drawer. Oh, in front of get, me. yeah, yeah. Uh, we should also institutionalize this. So maybe for the law department. Uh, I just sent it to you, Council Member Nusma. Thank okay. you. And maybe it should rotate to, uh, I will be following office chair, but whoever may be chair of rules as the enforcer of OMA at the time, whoever it is, should just read it and have that sense of advice. I, I think the one I sent you just is about litigation. You may need a second part to that. Okay, I can add that on the fly. Click and reply here, everybody. Or click and refresh, there we go. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so pursuant to five ILCS 120 slash 2A, I move that the city council convene into executive session to discuss agenda items regarding litigation and personnel. Uh, these agenda items are 
permitted subjects to be considered in executive session as enumerated in 5 ILCS 120-2A, uh, that is section C11 and C12. Is there a second? Second. Second. Councilmember. And C1, sorry, Councilmember Newsman, and C1 for personnel. And, uh, I'm sorry, C1. Second. Councilmember Newsman moves that we resolve into executive session to discuss items relating to personnel and, um, and potential litigation. Um, Councilmember uh, Wynn seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. Councilmember Wynn? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. With seven voting in favor and none voting against, the motion passes. And at 8.01 p.m., the January 24th meeting of the Evans City Council moves into executive session, which will um, continue in a, a different Zoom link. Um, thank you.